Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this Microsoft Reactor event. Um, this is going to be an Ask Me Anything on Visual Studio Code, and we have a few experts here with us today who are going to introduce themselves shortly. Please feel free to ask questions, and we will do our best to answer all of them. You should see an icon that is two text boxes with a question mark in the top text box. That is going to be our live event Q&A and where you can ask questions. Um, to get this started and to try it out and make sure everyone can find it, if you can all let us know where you're joining us from today, that would be great. Um, this session is being recorded and I will post a link to where you can find the recording in the event Q&A as well as well um, and also some links to some other upcoming reactor events that you might be interested in um, this evening at 5 30 p.m pacific time we will also be having an ama on github actions so if you can join us for that too i think there'll be a lot of great information there as well so now i will pass it over um, benjamin why don't we start with you and you can introduce yourself um, to the event today yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for having us. So hi, I'm uh, Ben. I'm uh, living in, in Zurich in Switzerland. So if it's a little bit dark in my room here, that's because there's no sun currently. Um, I've joined Microsoft in 2011, um, pretty much two months after um, like Eric started, my manager, <clears throat> and have been working on VS Code ever since. Um, I would say my current main responsibilities are to make sure VS Code is running good on all the platforms that we support, um, Windows, Mac and Linux, but also more recently that it runs well in the web around GitHub code spaces. So passing it to Harold. Thank you, Ben. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you for organizing this. Uh, it's pretty cool to talk to everybody. Um, I'm Harold. I'm based in the Bay Area. I'm a new product manager to the team. I just joined uh, a little more than two months ago. So I'm the counterpart to Ben who's been here for forever. Um, I'm focusing on making VS Code easier to use for more users. I'm focusing on a welcome page, uh, talking to a lot of users um, around the experience of, of having it set up. Uh, there's a lot of language teams also doing the same for VS Code. So it's a lot of coordination in, in the back that is just a one click experience. Yeah. I'm, Super excited to get all the questions. Perfect, thank you. So why we have um, a few folks, or while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I will start with a few other questions. The first one is gonna be when and why did you pick Electron as framework for VS Code? And if you both want to answer that, um, Benjamin, we can start with you. OK, um, yeah, so for, for those people that don't know, um, Electron.js is a cross-platform framework that allows you to use JavaScript or TypeScript as we do to build applications for a wide range of platforms. Uh, and we use it to ship VS Code on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. And it's built around Chromium and Node.js, so it's 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 pretty much the web framework for us to 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 um, ship VS Code to all platforms. And the decision to use Electron.js was done uh, at around the time when we decided to actually ship a cross-platform text editor in 2014, I think, um, because around that time we already had a couple of years worked on on Monaco. That's the code name. Um, which is an, a web-based editor, text editor. And it was natural for us to pick a, a framework where we could use this exact same code, the web code we already had, to, to ship this for all the platforms. So we didn't want to start from zero. And uh, it took us only a couple of months, I would say, in, in, in May 2015, we had, I think, the first version of VS Code out using Electron. And that was a really fun experience because we could take most of our existing code and just uh, ship it. And I should say that this allows us even to ship on all platforms at the same time because we are releasing monthly versions of VS Code on all platforms uh, with the same code. And uh, more recently, we will support Apple Silicon chips as well with our next release um, in January. So it's, it's nice to have this framework just supporting more platforms as we go as well as ARM platforms. 
um, without us having to actually invest a lot into it. So we are sitting on the shoulder of a large giant here, I would say. Perfect. And then Harold, would you like to answer this one as well? I think, yeah, from a product side, it's really interesting to have the uh, OpenJS Foundation now behind uh, the project as well. So, so it's a part of these open source stories that as more people uh, basically jumped in and started using it, there's a lot of evolution in Electron JS, fixing kind of all the things that in the in the in the past loaded down. So it's really exciting to to be part of that community as well. And and also bring back the uh, the improvements that are happening. I should I should maybe also say that we we have a very good relationship with the Electron team. I mean, we bought GitHub meanwhile, or at least Microsoft did. So, but that wasn't the case when we started. So we had um, very good relationship with Electron, um, and um, we're having one of the first um, workshops with them in San Francisco. I remember I think in 2016, and we were able to give lots of feedback and I think also contribute back. And um, yeah, I really think it's a great project as well as I think Node.js is a great project. So very nice to be able to use them open source. Awesome. And then one question we had come in from the audience um, was which are the most useful extensions for web development in VS Code? Um, I would say there, there are many. I mean, um, what's what's interesting is maybe what what our team is using for for development. Um, so VS Code is using TypeScript as the language. Um, we we were actually starting VS Code back when TypeScript was also starting at Microsoft. So pretty much from the beginning, we used TypeScript. And um, as such, I would say the TypeScript integration. It's an extension that we ship with VS Code bundle, but it's also an extension. So that to me is the the most Im important one um, for my day to day um, development. And I think then it it probably depends on what kind of um, language you're using or framework you're using um, to add to add more extensions um, on top. Um, so for me personally, I think I'm 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 happy with with mainly with the TypeScript one, um, but I'm not sure, Harold, if you have a list of favorite extensions you can talk about. Yeah, I think that the, the web is a sweet spot right now for VS Code. A lot of the things you need from CSS and JavaScript will just work outside the box. So there's a, and as Ben said, depending on if you use Angular or React or Vue, they all come with their own extensions maintained by the community. So there's, there's um, things to pick from. Same goes for CSS. So if you use SCSS or, or less, there's also more things that you can add on top to make things work. Then I think we see a lot of people kind of, um, also jumping between the front and back end, so depending on what you use in the back end, if it's Python or PHP, then also adding those extensions makes sense. Um, from what we see installed, there's a the the most common ones installed is Live Server, which um, which allows you to give you a live preview within the browser. Then it's also Prettier, which hooks into formatting that you uh, have probably set up. So there's the interesting part, I think, as you use VS Code, things will pop up and will get recommended to you. And I think also as a team, it's good. Um, it's now easier to add extensions to the workspace that you're working in as a recommended extension. So as you discover extensions that are useful for your project, it's also easy to get those to the rest of your team by adding them in the list. So, so hopefully you as a team can figure out what's most useful for yourself and then share that out. Perfect. Um, I just, we have a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Um, let me see. One that Alessandro mentioned or answered in the, um, in the live event Q&A, but some other folks may be interested in hearing about as well, is how well does VS Code integrate into Azure DevOps? Um, yeah. Um, 
I'm maybe not the best expert to talk to that, but I um, I know that there's a large set of extensions um, for Azure specifically, um, where we also work together with the Azure team um, to, to make them work well. Um, so from my personal experience, um, I was using lots of extension to manage websites inside VS Code, and I found that to be very useful. Um, but maybe Harold, if you're aware of more extensions there in that space. Yeah, I, I also now have hands-on experience with that, but I know that, that we were working very closely with the Azure teams. So a lot of the container extensions, a lot of the remote extensions come with Azure baked in already. So they, they would, um, most of those just work. If there's any specific ones that you're missing, I think uh, it's really useful to file bugs. But otherwise, um, we should have enough to allow you to work in a container locally and then de deploy those containers to Azure, which is think the, the flow a lot of people like these days. Great. Um, another audience question is, how do you prevent future creep? How do you decide what goes in the main app and what should you, or what should go in an extension? And this is coming in from Berlin. Oh. Hi, hi to Berlin. Um, I actually lived in Berlin for a long time. That's cool. Um, so I can try to answer that. Um, it's a very good question, and I think it's uh, something where we sometimes really discuss in the team if it makes sense to take some functionality into the core of VS Code or have it inside an extension. And this could also mean that we're actually deciding to ship an extension as part of VS Code. Um, we do have some what we call built-in extensions, so they can still be written as an extension, but we decide to ship them as part of VS Code, um, um, as part of the product actually. Uh, and one thing where we are trying um, to, to not take an extension in built-in is if we think it's too opinionated. Um, so for example, um, if an extension makes use of a certain technology, um, that we think is is, is not uh, used by everyone, then maybe it should really stay inside such an extension and then people can install it. Um, but another example is if we see that it, that some extensions really became very successful in trying to, to implement something that our users want, but they cannot execute as well because the, there are APIs missing, then we see that there's lots of desire and then we try to make these things work inside VS Code. So one example I would I should give is there are lots of extensions that allow you to modify CSS or the HTML inside VS Code. And we don't really like that because that, that really changes VS Code in a way that it's very hard for us to diagnose issues. But if we see that an extension is used so much because people want a certain feature that we just don't ship, then we are uh, considering to do it inside VS Code because it's better for us to to own this and control this on our end, as opposed to having users change our core parts of the workbench. Um, so I would say that's that's also reasoning there. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's the the extension way is is the uh, the way we can experiment with this. So there's so many great extensions like LifeShare and also Gitbins and others that are. You, you would have started them built into VS Code, but because they are extensions, they can also be built to uh, hook into more products where we can try them out. And it's a great way to experiment, to get feedback, to iterate quickly without being locked into VS Code. And they still feel um, integrated and they still feel 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 good, but but then it's, it's much easier than to say at some point, like these features we really like from these extensions and we can pull them in, but it's, it's Definitely, if you see something within the backlog and you like it, have a thumbs up, and that's the signal that we get from the community that there's something there that people are missing or that should be fixed or should be working differently. So there's a lot of lively discussions happening in issues uh, where we think about new features. All right, and it looks like Alessandro has gotten a lot of the other ones. Um, that he's answering. One that has come through that again, some other folks might be interested in also um, when they're watching the recording is, will VS Code eventually take the place of Visual Studio for .NET development? 
I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, the the thing that I I know is that um, Visual Studio Code becomes more powerful in in this in this space. Um, so I really like that, um, and I like that specifically because VS Code is just another way of authoring um, .NET or C++ or any code. So I, I don't think that it's about replacing Visual Studio, but it's about offering an alternative way of using these technologies in a more lightweight text editor. Um, so I think VS Code has some concepts that are maybe more familiar to people that are coming from a text editor space. And then Visual Studio itself has very powerful features when you are coming from an IDE space. And I, I, I never see the one replacing the other, but rather the one being a complement to the other, depending on how you want to use it. And the fact that you will be able to use VS Code in the browser, for example, through code spaces, that's just another way how you can use it. And then I see users switching seamlessly between Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, depending on their needs. Uh, for example, on the iPad, you would probably not be able to use Visual Studio, so it might be GitHub code spaces that you use there, but they they can all connect to the same remote. I mean, Visual Studio has the same support for connecting to these backends. So I think it's just a great family to have all these choices, um, and it's not about replacing one or the other. Great. Um, and then another question we got is, how do you handle human fatigue slash burnout when working on a project this scale in the open? Um, it's it's a question that also came up yesterday in the GitHub Universe talk, so I can I can try to start answering that. So we, for people that don't know, we had a talk yesterday about how we actually develop VS Code in the open, specifically on GitHub. Um, and I think Alex Ross from the team was answering that and was talking about it. So it's. It's true that I would say our main source of, of feedback that we are receiving is through GitHub issues. Um, it's it's the main, it's it's the most direct way of talking to us because every GitHub issue is being um, assigned to a developer. You're not you're never talking to um, someone that is not really deeply involved in the project. So it's not like a support team chiming in and trying to ask questions. It's usually us developers um, that that chime in. So. A lot of us are getting overwhelmed by these issues and emotions um, that sometimes can happen. But um, what we have trying to build in the last years is a lot of automation around how we can actually manage this uh, these issues. So you will see we added bots that automatically talk to you sometimes if that's helpful for us. Uh, you will see um, automatic duplicate detection or like lots of little helpers that made sure that only those issues um, are getting attention that are really of well quality and well written and that we can act on. Um, and at the same time, I would say we have established a process where we have a good rhythm of how we work on VS Code and that we ship monthly and that we have time reserved, for example, to um, reduce the issue count as we just did last month where we really spent a whole month on, on, on looking into issues and getting the number down. So I would say we have tuned this process over the years. And if you're curious, the recording, I think, is out for the talk that we gave yesterday. Yeah. Perfect. And so, Harold, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it's, as in my first two months, uh, like one thing I really noticed is the process and how a lot of the features got a lot of planning and iteration and focus. Uh, Why also people help the community to land things and it's all kind of weaved into the team culture and the process that's already in place. So there's some constraints and how much you can take on. There's some before the month, there is an agreement on what things are being worked on and that's that list is the, the essential part and then there's a stretch list of things that we might get done or might get not done or something that that really helps to have all the discussions in place all the ux discussions all the follow-up all the community involvement in place to to not burn out on, on issues i think always a burnout happens when you work on something for too long you work on too many things in parallel you have to maintain tickets you have to go back to community so by 
by having the community input on which issues are most important with the thumbs up and then seeing like being able to go back to those threads with ideas, coming up with a solution, iterating on a front end, getting that into insiders, having feedback on it. I think there's a lot of things already in place that can answer questions quickly so people don't kind of churn on an issue for too long. So I think that, that, that always helps. So I think the, the open source part is for the size of the project, the automation really helps. But I think also that, that everybody in the team is on GitHub, is on Twitter and answering questions and helping. Perfect, thank you both. Um, so the next one, will code space, it's sort of a two part question. Uh, will code spaces support all VS code extensions? And how do you use dot files in code space? Says code space. Um, I think I understood the first part of the question. The second I maybe have to follow up. So um, all the extensions will work in inside a code space. Um, technically, maybe that's that's less known. We we run these extensions inside um, the backend of that code space. So as, at the same time, where you can open a terminal to the code space to actually use the, all the command line tools that you like, the extensions will have the same view on the file system, and they just work the same way as they would work if you install them locally. Um, so there's there's uh, no no limit in what you can use. Um, I'm not sure about the dot files um, you 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 can you can I mean if this is about like uh, project configuration uh, you can configure git you can configure um, editor config so all these things will work as if it was running um, locally um, so that should be fine I can take you the other one so uh, for uh, there's basically the old history of putting your your files in github also with the dot file. So if you have a repo named DOT files, then this will be pulled into as the shell is being bootstrapped on on a machine. So basically all you need to do is having your having your having those files within GitHub within that repo and it will be uh, set up. So it's an easy way to customize the terminal to to add more dependencies. And it's yeah it's very transparent and it's installed for every code space that you load up as you load it up. All right, perfect. Um, so the next one that's come in is why, um, sorry, I'm going, why VS Code doesn't have the proper setup for CPP codings? Um, it's a bit difficult, or it's a bit difficult working with it. And then maybe how we are looking to improve that. I think my, my first answer is if you if you have something that doesn't work, try to write a good um, bug report because they have uh, it's an extension as far as I can I can sell. It's a C plus plus extension. It's also done by Microsoft, and we maintain very good relationship to that team. Um, so if you if you have something that doesn't work nice, try to explain this in a nice bug report. Um, and, and be very descriptive. And um, I think that's the biggest chance of, of, of getting something addressed. Um, at least from my experience, when I receive a bug report, if something is, is very well written and I can explain it, do it. Um, and I think that's the, that's the best way. I think that's the advantage of having a direct channel to the developers through these GitHub issues. Yeah, and I, I know the, the CVP coding, the those languages have very heavy investment right now. So as soon as you file a bug, people will be all over it. Um, but it's also, I think, one of the places when what I see from the bugs and from the team, it's just a vast ecosystem of dependency management of build tools. So hitting all the sweet spots really requires feedback from the community. Like I'm, I'm using this combination of tools and dependency management things, and this is not working well. So it just it's a it's an ongoing refinement of making everything that users can come up with work work nicely. All right, and then I think with time, we have a couple minutes left, so we probably have time for one last question. So the last question for today will be, um, if dev containers can help with C++ development. Um. 
Yes. <laughs> yeah, anyway, that's, so I think, yeah, as soon as you have set up your dev container with all the tools, uh, we know from large C++ projects, it's more common now within, for example, game companies because they have these massive machines that they have to work on, which you can't get home necessarily when you work from home. So we definitely saw that that pick up a lot, and C++ is one of the sweet spots with all the dependency management with the long build times if you have your local container or if you have a cloud container it's it's really one of those places where this works extremely well and if not then yeah we want to make it better great are there any last comments or anything else you either of you would like to mention before we go today well, I think I just saw a question appearing how to get in, in contact with the VS Code team. And I also mentioned that in my talk yesterday, really our, our VS Code repository on, on Microsoft slash VS Code on GitHub is a very good place to start learning about VS Code. We have tons of material for how to uh, develop on VS Code. So feel free to do pull requests, feel free to look at our um, uh, roadmaps and iteration plans and engage and give those upvotes to, to issues you really would like to see fixed. Perfect. Yeah. Plus 100. <laughs> Just, yeah, it's, it's really, we love to see things uh, through the community. If you have something on Twitter, we also usually get back to that. So, whatever channel you find to talk to a team, uh, questions on Stack Overflow also work really well. That's something we we keep looking at. And then if you see questions for VS Code that we missed, uh, we'd love to have a, have a nudge there. So, it's been great. Thank you both so much for your time today. Um, we got through a lot of questions, so I really appreciate it. And everyone else, I have put a few um, a few links in the live event Q&A where you can find more reactor events. There's also a link to Benjamin and Alex's session at GitHub Universe that Alessandro just added, and then also a link to our YouTube page where we will place this recording in the next 24 to 48 hours if you would like to share it with anybody or rewatch it again. Thank you all so much for joining us today, and we hope you can join us for another event soon. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.